Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in TradFi, digital assets, technology, and financial planning. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, and joining me on the desk this afternoon, we have Ina Braverman, co-founder of EcoPower Wave, Caroline Vanderlip, founder and CEO of Redish, and finally, we have Rick Fox, co-founder and CEO of Partana. They join me to discuss the need for accountability, infrastructure, and the role of technology in sustainable solutions. It is great to have all of you with us. Welcome to Trade Talks. And before we get into the future and the role of technology and sustainable solutions, Let's quantify this a bit. You know, we'll go around the table here. What is a sustainable solution? So a sustainable solution is a, a solution that does basically good for the environment, for the people, something that basically like has a very positive impact, changes the lives of people for the best. So my company, we do clean electricity from the waves, wave energy. So that's basically meaning that we're able to eliminate some of the polluting solutions such as oil, coal, gas, diesel, which are not good for the environment, not good for the health of the local population, and switch it with something that is 100% environmentally friendly. So we look at sustainability as something that's good for the environment. Um, at Redish, where we are replacing single-use disposable packaging with reusable packaging and the service to make it reusable, to wash it, sanitize it, etc. Um, we look at sustainability as how much carbon emission can we, you know, avoid, how much water can we not use, how much waste can we reduce. And so, you know, kind of our credo is never landfill, and our credo is you can't manage waste, you have to reduce it. So we're all about, we kind of equate sustainability to reuse. I love that. The, the foundation has been set in, at Partana. We are taking uh, big industry upscale waste and we're turning it into carbon negative, removing building materials that avoid and remove CO2. So changing the way we build in the world uh, and tackling it first through the construction industry. So what is the role of technology and infrastructure in sustainable solutions? What exactly are you doing at Partana that is gonna change the world of construction? Well, for us, uh, the construction industry, if you uh, may not know, takes up about 38% of the responsibility for all the negative emissions that are out there in the world. Uh, out of that, uh, we look at the cement impact, which is about 9% of that. Uh, we are an alternative binder. We take cement out of the production of concrete. Uh, we avoid and remove CO2 in that process, and we get to a finished product that is more nature positive. So if you're looking at how are we gonna move forward and evolve in our construction choices, we provide not only countries, but uh, developers, uh, and those that are willing to be first movers to make wiser choices around their building materials. And you're based in the Bahamas and your particular <coughs> solution is also resistant to salt water. Yes, uh, if you are aware that 2% of the water that's used in the world is used to make concrete, uh, we do not use, we don't need to use fresh water. We can use salt water. Uh, and in the innovation of this, uh, through the inv invitation of the Prime Minister of the Bahamas to come to the Bahamas, it was on the heels of homes being destroyed through flooding. Uh, we're a small island developing nation, so we're slowly going underwater. When concrete is met with, well, cement-based concrete is met with salt water, it erodes and it destroys. Uh, so in our case, we get stronger. So it's so important, um, the water component of this, because people lose sight of the fact that there's not enough clean water in the world. And granted, what we're using here in New York doesn't necessarily impact what's in Africa or someplace else. The water conservation is really important and um, that's something we look at very, very carefully as well. So we, people say to us all the time, if you're reusing a cup or reusing a container or reusing a cosmetic um, container, um, you need water to wash it. Um, but what you find is that when you do it at scale, you need way less water than if you were doing it um, independently or manufacturing that product to begin with. And so we look, we think water is really important as well as carbon and waste um, and applaud what you're doing, obviously. Yeah. Why isn't recycling enough? It's kind of been drilled into our heads to recycle. Well, you know, it's, um, we're sitting here in New York where the recycling rate is less than 10%. Um, obviously there are communities around the country and around the world that are much higher than that, but um, there's a tremendous amount of uh, contamination. Uh, which causes most products that are put out for recycle not to be recycled, and they all go to landfill. So we've all seen those, you know, huge pictures of, you know, people living on top of landfills and garbage that's overflowing. That's really what we're trying to tackle. Um, and unfortunately, uh, recycle is not the answer. If you look at the um, EPA pyramid, there's a reason they put reuse at the top of it, because when you can reuse product, 
um, you get way more um, productivity out of it, and you're not using the resources that are necessary to actually manufacture it. But I want to go back to your question around technology and sustainability, because I think it's really important, especially as you get to products that need scale. All of these solutions need scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking earlier about kind of the chicken and egg of, um, you know, how do you get any of these solutions to a sustainable price? Um, you know, while you're building scale to, to do that. And, and it's complicated. In, in the case of reusability and circularity, we're looking at technology in two ways. One is how can we use technology to replace the people that are on an assembly line that are needed to um, take dirty packaging and wash it, right? Um, so we've actually developed a bunch of automation that we are in the process of patenting, but there's so much more to do. The other is software, which is when you move to any of these solutions, I can't speak to my colleagues here, but when you m move to any of these solutions, you need different kind of software to manage it. The existing software, which is mostly one way, particularly in reuse, no longer applies. So what we've done at Redish is we've developed software that essentially accounts for the fact that our inventory um, is both at our plant, but it's also at our clients' offices, and it's also in transport back and forth because we're like a laundry service or a linen service only for packaging. Right. And that's a great point. So, you know, I want to follow on. You're only as good as your suppliers, right, right. Is, is what it sounds like. Um, and, you know, what you're doing, tell us more about what you're doing in California um, at the Port of L.A. It sounds like it's, it's a big project that requires private and, and public partnerships to execute. So what we're doing in the Port of LA is actually very exciting. We're building the first uh, onshore, nearshore wave energy power station uh, that will be connected to the electrical grid. Uh, the, the power station will be built in collaboration with Shell. We just yesterday signed an agreement with Shell, which are being the co-investors uh, of the project. Um, it's a real big breakthrough because the potential of wave energy in California is immense. You can produce about 69% of all California's electricity solely from the power of the waves. Hmm. Now, what's good in our technology is the fact that we take something that is unused and it th that is actually damaging the environment. We take breakwaters, piers, jetty, you know, these bulky, huge cement structures that every port has, mm -hmm. and we turn it into a source of clean electricity. So we connect floaters on the external side of this structure, and they just go up and down with the movement of the waves, producing clean electricity. So not only usually that the port kind of have to justify why are they building this breakwater, because again, cement in the water is a new presence on the ocean floor, which is not good for the environment. They're also not making any money of it, right? Because, you know, you just have to maintain it to protect the port from storms. Here, they're getting a solution that gives them clean electricity, which is very important to ports because they're one of the highest polluting entities in the United States and in the world. And they're actually getting to get revenues from the use of something that they couldn't rent for like a hotel or like to use it for any other purpose. Uh, so I think really real sustainable solution is one is repurposing something mm -hmm. that is polluting to something that is good to in the environment that you can't eliminate because you won't eliminate the breakwater. So instead of eliminating it, repurposing it. And on the other hand, creating something good and valuable, which is clean electricity to take down the emissions of the port to show that the port can become a green port. Uh, in the port of LA alone, they have one of the biggest breakwaters in the United States. You can generate 60 megawatts of power. That's, for comparison, it's about 60,000 households. Like that's a big game changer, a power station like that. Now, if we're looking at the whole United States, according to the United States Energy Information Administration, uh, wave energy can generate 66% of all the United States energy needs. So what's good for me to see as an entrepreneur originally coming from Israel, I'm not from here, is the real openness of the United States to this kind of innovative solution. You know, wave energy never happened here in the past. Mm -hmm. Solar and wind happened and really like exploded and extended in a very po positive way kind of. And right now we see the first time legislation passed in California, signed into law by Governor Newsom just a month ago specifically for wave energy, the DOE, the NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, all coming out with collaboration and grants for wave energy. So really, like, it's the best timing to bring wave energy to the United States, and it's very great to feel that welcomed. But it seems like these solutions are so obvious. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, you, I mean, you have a company like Shell, which yeah. we would not think of as an alternative yeah. 
you know, renewable yeah. source um, company. What are some of the roadblocks, what are some of the challenges of getting these types of solutions online? It seems to make sense. I, I would tell you that change is not easy, right? Getting people to change what they've been doing for 200 years in the case of uh, concrete creation, the burning of rocks and the making of cement has been here for 200 years. And so uh, as we bring this new alternative binder and an option to get to concrete to the world, getting people to adapt, uh, whether it be in the building codes, whether it be in their own uh, uh, approvals of that in their in their countries, it takes time. It takes time. So fighting the, uh, the, the change is something that people don't really enjoy. Right. Isn't it also about entrenched interests? Well, of course. Um, so, well, right. In <laughs> other words, that you're not you're, you're you're developing you're developing a new solution at the same time as you're fighting. You know, not fighting, but you know, a, as people on the other side are trying to convince the world otherwise. So, uh, you have and you have less resources to do it, right? Well, yeah, well I would tell you that you spend your energy and time with people that actually don't need to be convinced, right? right. Uh, and so, wherever that is in the world, in our case. I'm a steward of a, of a material that has to get out into the world as quickly as possible to have the impact that we know it can have and that it's already having. Uh, but the conversations that we have, whether it be with a, a world leader in, in the Bahamas who is calling for innovation and supporting it, uh, he becomes an example of what is possible. It's, it's just one country, but now we're in other countries now uh, discussing this as a, as a possibility to a reality of the way of doing things, evolving and change comes in time, we're trying to move it at a pace that is uncomfortable for some people. And it sounds like you would agree that public-private partnership is really important to yes. get this to scale. Yes. Um, because, um, I hate to say this, but unfortunately we need some legislation to change people's habits, to yes. ask people to, to do so. Um, we're starting to see a groundswell of consumers who are interested in sustainability and starting to think twice before throwing something away. Um, fast fashion is a perfect example of people who are either avoiding it completely or at least making sure that there's um, a, 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 a repurpose to that in some, fa in some way. Um, but we find that because it requires a habit change, um, you'll get a certain portion of the population uh, and then others who just won't pay attention to it um, unless they have to. And, you know, at, at what point does this become something that the takes, public it, really gets involved, it right? It takes leadership. You mentioned Gavin Newsom. I, I obviously spent many years in California, so I know the leadership around California in this conversation. Um, I just mentioned the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. um, I have two examples of private sector people, uh, John Pagano at the Red Sea, Jerry Anzarello at Doria Gate. These are, these are CEOs mm -hmm. in leadership positions that can mandate uh, the focus of their teams on these changes and these shifts that not are, are not necessarily comfortable maybe to, to uh, you know, GCs and construction workers. And so it takes that type of leadership. Absolutely. I also think part of the challenge is too, just to push back a bit, fast fashion as an example, EVs as an example, Consumers are concerned about cost. They might think about cost first mm -hmm. before they think about the um, challenges that fast fashion introduces, uh, you know, to the world. And I think that's part of it. And of course, you know, to your point earlier, there are incumbents. Mm -hmm. They're very powerful. That have lobbies in D.C. and that also influences legislation as well. So I think those are two barriers that need to be overcome: is one, consumer cost and, and legislation, of course. But part of that can be overcome back to the point of scale. Yes. But I think in addition to scalability, how are you quantifying? It's one thing to say that you have a sustainable solution or you're putting sustainable practices into your corporate strategy. How do you quantify that? Uh, that's partly what the technology does. We think it's so important to be able to quantify it. So um, in our case, we've done a very ex extensive life cycle assessment of both our products as w and process as well as those that we're replacing. And we share those metrics on a, in a real-time way with all of our clients. Um, they can then use those for ESG metrics or just for communication with their vendors and employees and the like. But we really do it so that we know what our impact is. Um, our first full year of operation was commercially was last year. We know that we washed 1.7 million units just in the New York market. That translates to almost 100,000 pounds of waste that was diverted. So we're, we are very, very um, serious about data and making sure that we're not just introducing something that sounds good, but that actually has real results. Yeah. 
Uh, and Ina, from, you know, you're doing that work in the port of LA, how are you able to quantify that, you know, is the cost of electricity getting cheaper? Is anything um, quantifiable that's happening with the environment that you can share? So of course, in renewable energy, I think it's a little bit maybe easier to quantify because first of all, you see how much energy, how many kilowatt hours you produce per year. And you're comparing it to what would happen if you would produce it with a different source, with traditional source, such as oil, for example. So you're seeing how much actually carbon emissions you're saving. You even have calculators that show you how many cars you kind of took off the road or how many like polluting uh, factories have you t took out basically or took down their emission because of your power production. Other impact that is very important to us is creating green jobs because like we see our project as very communi community oriented project. We want people to be involved so we construct all the main elements of the power stations in the country that we're making the project. So for the Port of Los Angeles, all the suppliers will be from California and from LA. So you're not only creating new industry and a new way of producing clean electricity, but you're also creating clean jobs. So there's many, many different ways that you can quantify the advantages. Even like something that we didn't think of in the beginning of the process, the breakwater that we build on is something that costs a lot of money, of course, for the port to build. And every few years they invest millions of dollars in maintenance because you have erosion from the power of the waves during storms. So when you put the floaters on the external side of the breakwater, it becomes kind of the first line. So it gets all the destructive waves into it before it actually reaches the breakwater. So even by doing the project, you're not only producing clean electricity, you're extending the lifespan of the breakwater. So there's many financial advantages, health advantages, uh, job creation advantages, and that's kind of where we want to be. We want it to be like supported by government because as both of you said, we need legislation in order to be able to promote it faster, but we also want it to be supported by the person, by the, community. By the simple person, yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody say, wow, I'm so happy they came here. I got a job because of them, you know? Like that's also very, very important to us because a lot of the change starts from down up, not necessarily. Which is a great point that you make because we, we're thinking about how technology, there's this narrative, it's gonna replace jobs and yeah. so forth, but it almost sounds like this is a natural way to retrain or upskill exactly. the workforce because sustainable energy is, is faster growing. It's yeah. not yep. pulling back. You're doing it in energy, we're doing it by upscaling big industry waste. So you talk right. about landfills. We right. take waste and landfills and we turn it into carbon negative and avoiding building materials. Right, so when you talk about how we measure it, thankful, thankfully for us in science, you know, everything is quantifiable. The amount of CO2 we absorb, the amount of good we're doing, the amount of square feet we're getting out into the world, the amount of developers that are incorporating this into their building uh, 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 choices, the amount of countries that implement us into their building codes. All of this are measurable for, for us as we move forward. Uh, the exciting part of this is as we generate through our, our, our building materials the choices uh, and celebrate those in terms of ESG uh, narratives for developers and, and countries, drawing down NDCs, uh, drawing down and the create through the creation of carbon credits, the ability of how we use those to incentivize home ownership through uh, down payments, redistribution of wealth, taking carbon credits and using them in a different way, uh, in a more positive way. So we can measure all of that through the fact that science has proven our formula to reduce uh, CO2 from our atmosphere, avoiding it through the replacement of cement uh, and through direct air capture. We cure at room temperature. We don't need any energy. We get to a concrete that can build anything out there in the world. So when you think of the, the concrete industry and the construction industry at large, anything that you can make with concrete and cement, you can make with Partana. You know, Jill, I think what all these solutions are aiming to do is to uh, create a whole different conversation and to educate not just the business community but consumers as well. And when you start to do that education, um, it's amazing how individuals start to contribute as well um, and start to think about what they're doing, what they're throwing away, what they're using. Um, and there's, there's a cascading effect that I think is really, really important. So it's not just the three of us at this table, obviously. It's everybody who's got um, a sustainable business idea that's trying to kind of push it forward, all having the same goal, if you will, which is to address the environmental issues that we people find start, ourselves with today. People start asking for, for materials that absorb and avoid and remove CO2, you know that people are now starting to be right. educated that there are even things out there yeah. in the world. We will end that on a positive note then. <laughs> we appreciate everyone's yeah. insight. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. And thanks for joining me from the NASDAQ market site. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.